All right, people. When I say let's keep it real, Brandon and I have kept it real. And such an old pro. He's going with it. I've never done this ever before. I love first. So we're doing this on our phones. Brandon. Yes. I, thank you for like rolling. Up. What can I say? You have to have big balls. That's one of your books, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you got to have balls. That's the uh, that's the second book. And uh, thanks for having me. We've got to keep it real. So sometimes the uh, wind well, and tech doesn't always work great. I know. Well, it's really windy in Philly. But let me just go back and tell them a little bit about you. Brandon is a serial entrepreneur, marketing and branding thought leader, author, speaker, and media personality. Through decades of experience in marketing, adaptability, yay, Brandon has become a thought leader in the marketing and branding space and now brings his insights and skills to ambitious entrepreneurs looking to build their own empires. So even before you came on, I was going through all the questions people had for you. And first of all, they wanted to know what it was like being around a lot of athletes. We can get into that. But I always ask my guest, what's one word for the past 30 days the best described it and why? But they wanted me to change it up for you. They said, ask them what's one word to describe what it's like being with all those athletes and what, why did you pick it? So I've never done that before. You wanted me to check, you know, change the way I did things. Well, just one thing real quick, you know, I'm not with Steiner sports anymore. Um, yeah. With collect, you know, my new companies, which I started four years ago at the age of 60, I might add a collectible exchange, which, you know, it's a, it's a marketplace. You buy and sell collectibles. We help people evaluate, authenticate, verify their stuff. And then star stock, we have over a million trading cards. So if you're one of those people who have all these trading cards in a draw somewhere, you know, we're here to help you with white glove service, get the cards authenticated and graded, and then help you sell them. And then if you're a card collector, you, there's a great place to go on the site and buy cards. Um, to answer your question, I mean, I think when you work with a lot of talented people, whether they're athletes, celebrities, you know, it's humbling. I, I think that, you know, you have to keep a high level of humility. Um, and I think it's just a good probably characteristic to have in general. I think that what gets confusing is that when people meet high profile people, celebrities, athletes, the immediate thought is about what you can get and, and what that's going to mean and what you want. And, and I'm thinking about what value I can provide. Um, yeah. That's that's how I look at every relationship is what can I do for that person to help them serve them or solve something that may be a problem for them. So. You know, value is what you can do for someone that they can't do for themselves. And even an athlete and a celebrity or even a high profile person all have problems. Your goal in a business, being a business person, you know, being a solution based business person is to find out what problems a person you're trying to develop a relationship with and see if you can help them solve it. And in some cases, and this is what people have a hard time with, doesn't always benefit you. You can't be in nice. this thing for a give and get, you know, it's not going to get you a high level on the ladder. you got to be in a, in a mindset that you're going to do everything you can and anything you can for as many people as you can, even if you don't get anything back. And then, you know, most people, when you're able to help them and serve them, you know, they want to do something back. And it, it usually is a great relationship initiator. And that's the, that's the tools that I use. I mean, I don't get in a room and start talking to an athlete thinking about anything other than what the hell value can I provide that player? What can I do for them that they're not going to be able to do themselves and that can re that's really important to them? And if I do do that, then they're open for discussion on some of my other ideas because I now have a little credibility and relationship with them. And I've done plenty of things for a lot of people and I still haven't heard back from them. And I, I get that, you know, it's, it's a game you're playing. It's not a, it's not a one straight, easy highway where, you know, you do something like I see a lot of kids like I just did this for you. Now you better do something back for me. Like it's yeah. not really how the high level if you want to get to extraordinary game gets played. You know, I don't know if you know this, but not that we were in the same area, but my entire life I owned health clubs and I in the Philadelphia area, and I sold them in 2019. But I also worked with sports teams. I worked with mostly the Flyers at Snyder. And I was more of their inside, you know, working with the athletes as a fitness trainer. And then I also worked with a lot of the other teams. And the reason I think I got indoors, not just because I knew what I was doing, is because they said, 
I'll never forget, Sandy, you're not trying to get something from us. They always said that. You're not, I don't even think I have a picture of any of them. Now that was a mistake, but I'll never forget that. We don't feel like you're trying to manipulate us. I go, my whole job is to get you back on the, you know, out there. And I'll never forget that. It stuck with me my entire life. Good lesson, it's right? It's everything. Uh, yeah. But, you know, a lot of people struggle with that. And I get it. You know, life isn't always fair. Uh, the game isn't always fair. Um, you're going to do some stuff for people that are going to take advantage, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, when I <laughs> ask people about why they aren't going further with their career, why they aren't putting more into it, a good amount of those people will say, I don't, I don't think it's going to work out for me. You know, this person screwed me. This happened. I've seen this happen. I've seen that happen. You know, you know, you come up with a story. The average person has uh, 50,000 thoughts in a day and 70% of them are negative. So, you know, you're battling before you go out and battle in the world, you're battling, you know, an, an inside game, you know, where, you know, you, your own little mindset is telling you all the bad stuff that could happen. And then you get out in the real world, you deal with that combat. So, you know, you got to be careful, you know, about how your mindset is and about how you're going to go. And if you're bulletproof ready to deal with all the negativity out there. So it, that's leading me to my next question. They want to know, what do you do to keep in a positive mindset? They know I'm all about how you start your day and routine. Do you have something specific you do every single day to shift you into more yeah, positive? I mean, well, well, first of all, you know, I, I start with a high level of gratitude. I mean, even when some of the worst things that happen and even deals that I lose, which happens every day, I mean, I'm, I'm losing at a record. As I become more successful, I mean, I'm losing on a higher level. So, you know, yeah. it's, painful. it's painful. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I like losing. But, you know, I find gratitude in, in everything I do. Um, and the more that I want to succeed, the more I know I need to have more gratitude and be more grateful for what I have. You can't get more unless your gratitude is high for what you already have. So, you know, I meditate in the morning and I really try to get a workout in of some kind of cardio of at least 40 minutes to an hour every morning to kind of get rid of some of the edge off of me because, you know, I've got my own ADHD and OCD going and, you know, running these companies, you know, a place like collectible change where things are coming from so many directions, you can get, you're crazy. You can go down that rabbit hole. And so, you know, the workout's important. Uh, yeah. The meditation late in the last couple of years, I've only really started getting into it and never thought I'd be meditating, but it's critical. Uh, you know, eating well, <laughs> sleeping well, all the stuff. It's like, I don't think there's any secret of, you know, how you can get to an extraordinary level, like doing it, you know, eating yeah. well, sleeping well, you know, uh, being kind, all the things you're supposed to do. It's like, geez, it's a bunch of boxes you got to check every day. And it's not, they're not flexible. When you stop checking them, something's going to start coming out from underneath that you're not going to like. But, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, I think like it's just really, really important, even if some of the worst things that happen to you to, to find gratitude and be, and be grateful. Because the fact that it did happen meant you know you're alive well, and I don't think any prom anybody promised you a full rose garden without some of those buds dying. So <laughs> you got to realize like some of the deal, you know, some of the deal is going to be not great, but it's all part yeah. of the process of ultimately where you want to go. Uh, for me, you know, I've had some incredible ups. Um, it's epic. I'm, I'm very grateful, and I've had some really shitty things happen. You know, like. Uh, that you know it's a bummer but all of it has always transpired into something ultimately better uh i've always gotten a lift from even some of the worst things that's happened to me um i'm not happy when i'm going through those bad things by the way and sometimes it's 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 you know you need your friends you need your people around you to help you get through too but hey um you look at some of your biggest adversity and some of your biggest setbacks and you look back on them you realize like wow I'm glad I went through that because I'm so much better for it now. And I, I believe it. Yeah. I think it's the hardest thing. I teach a group of high school kids entrepreneurship. And the hardest thing for them to understand is that they're going to learn from the failure. So they said, I have questions for them. With the way things are now, Brandon, do you still think it's important that I understand that failure is just part of the process. Is there ways I can avoid it? No. You know, the problem <laughs> is, is like, you know, when you see younger people, they say, you know, you could be anything you want if you work hard. 
Well, that's bullshit. That's not true. I mean, you can't be anything you want. I don't know why people tell people that, but you can be a lot of things if you work hard. And the goal yeah. is not for you to be anything. The goal is for you to find the thing that you were put on this planet to be and, and do it and do it well and enjoy it. I think people say, don't be afraid to fail. I'm afraid to fail. I don't know why people say that. It's not, it's bullshit. Like I'm incredibly, I, I, I hate failing. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, I'm scared to death to fail. However, I'm not afraid to try. I know yeah. the failing's coming. It's not, failing is not the opposite of success. It's a part of success. It would be like drinking that coffee without the mug. I mean, it's like, it's yeah. part of the deal. You know what I mean? Like it, it's part of the deal. And if you're not prepared to have those kinds of ups and downs, then you're not prepared to be an entrepreneur. Because what's crazy on the entrepreneurial thing is that when you win, and you will, I mean, it's a high and it's a buzz that I can't even describe. It's awesome. But realize that as your winning increases, if you believe that you're also going to lose, your losing increases and those losses get bigger and they become more dramatic. And if you're not built to handle some of those losses, it'll crush you as opposed to, you know, being able to pick yourself up. And um, not a lot of people have that in them. And that's OK. It's not for everyone. I always say entrepreneurism is, you know, one understanding being really an expert at your craft Two, it's being able to lead people to something that they can't even see you know there's a space that you're willing to fill and you're trying to talk to people and it's you have to have a sales and a leadership quality and then third thing is you got to have the ability to adopt risk and this is where people jump off the train because you you got to be able to fail and put your house up put everything up and realize you may lose it all and don't think i haven't had to do that like but that you have to enjoy that. Like you're going to, you're not going to the craps table. You're going to the business table. And at some point you're going to put everything on 33 red, which is, you know, yeah. this, this deal, this deal, this product, the service you've come up with. So that's why I tell entrepreneurs, slow down, you know, make sure you become an expert in what you're doing, get some real business experience. You don't have to jump right into entrepreneurism. You, know, yeah. you can have an entrepreneurial mindset while still working for someone else. And this is the great advice my mother gave me. So I've been working for 10 years when I got out of school. And my mother said I didn't even have to go to college, but I, I wanted to. I believe in school. But when I got out of school, I'm like, I'm going to start my own business. My mother's like, you're not starting your own business. You're not, you don't know nothing about business. But you may, <laughs> you do have a good work ethic. You know uh, about a bunch of things. Like, you need to go work for some people and learn how the, the do's and don'ts and the ABCs of how business works. And I, I really stress that to entrepreneurs that may be watching. Like, it's okay to go work and slave and work for someone else for uh, five, six, seven years to see how PLs work, hire, fire, how you run a meeting, uh, how you go make pitches, how you do decks, all those things. You can't take all those things for granted. You can only do so much of that in school. And all that read, stuff makes yeah. the soup. Did I read somewhere that were you in hospitality when you first got out of school? All right. Yeah. Yeah, I was in the hotel restaurant business. That was my dream job, worked for Hyatt. And, you know, I went to work for Hyatt when I got out of school. And I got fired. I had three promotions, got fired, got into some politics with some upper level managers, and then they figured out a way to get rid of me. And I called my mother up. I was crying, literally. This is my dream job and three promotions. I thought I'd work my whole life at Hyatt. And I said, Mom, can you believe what these people did to me? She said, Did to you? Hyatt, they're looking for good people. They're, they're trying to hold on to all the best people they have. Obviously, you got some quirk, you know, you still got some rough spots around your game. You're going to need to work out some of your management style. I highly recommend you do some serious thinking about your, your management style and how you're approaching business because you're still rough around the edges. And that was really the game change. I went to the bookstore, I'm not a big reader, and, you yeah. know, uh, think and grow rich and, and you know, uh, how to win friends, influence people. And, and I started reading everything and I started really uh, resetting my style, my approach. Everything. And uh, that was the beginning of, of the run, really. God bless mom. Oh, mom, I could write a book on my mother's stories. That's, the, you know, you got to have balls. This book actually was named after her. That was her favorite line. You got to have balls. You know, be relentless, be resilient. Don't stop it. Just or, just don't stop at success. Nobody remembers people that are successful. They remember the extraordinary ones, the people that are the best at what they did. So don't get carried away just because you have a little success. And um, that's that's having balls, you know, being able to go the distance and also ha having faith. I think a lot of young entrepreneurs, like you talk about kids in high school, 
Yeah. And what they don't realize that you have to have faith. Faith is a very key ingredient in business. And, 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 um, you know, you, you need to have enthusiasm as well. Um, and, and faith in it, faith, it comes from, you know, curiosity, you know, looking into the unknown and also, uh, enthusiasm. The, the root word of enthusiasm is enthusios, which is to be with God. And, you know, and that's where your enthusiasm comes in is like you're, you're curious, you're pushing towards something that maybe you really don't know how it's going to work, how it's going to end up. Uh, and, and, you know, the best relationships you have, whether it be with your girlfriends or marriages or partners, you know, you have to have enthusiasm that, that this is going to work. And you need that in business. You need to have faith. And faith also is believing in something that you can't see. So if you don't have that kind of enthusiasm and curiosity in you, it's going to be very hard for you to be a high profile, high level serial entrepreneur because a lot of the stuff that you're pushing and dreaming and selling is coming from curiosity but also it's something you can't see and you got to believe that what you're thinking what you're feeling and what you're visioning is the right way is the right path and if you believe in god you believe in your strategy you believe in yourself those are the things you need do you still go out and speak or are you do mostly virtual or do you go? No, I, I do. I mean, I speak around the country, um, you know, when I have the time, obviously, uh, when I convince my wife to come with me. But, yeah, I mean, I, I love speaking. All my money from my books and speaking goes to charity. So I've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity through my books and speaking. You know, I'm grateful enough that I don't need that money. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, I realize that one of the main reasons why I'm here is to help others. You know, I've always been somebody who enjoy. You know, helping people is not a burden. It, it, it's actually leads you to sheer joy, actually. And uh, I think sometimes people think, well, when I later on, I'll, I'll do not like on any level of giving is a level of leadership. So if it's a dollar, it's an hour, it's 30 minutes. I'm not particularly good at going to a food bank and, and serving people food, but I am good at going to get a couple of different, you know, a couple hundred cases of food for the food bank, you know, figuring out how to finagle a deal and get that like. So, you know, you find your niche of how you can help people the most. Um, you know, my wife teaches kids uh, how to read in a grade school in a bad neighborhood. And I'd rather just go and redo the library. So she's got the books and everything she needs, as opposed to I'm probably not going to go and sit with kids and read. But you find your niche of how to help people. It's, it's a big part of why you're here. And then the other reason why you're here is what's really important is your rate of growth. You know, you've got to be a rose. You know, what's your rate of self-effectiveness? And, you know, if you're not growing, then you're certainly not on a path to be an entrepreneur, which means your, your, your curiosity, enthusiasm is at a low. But your rate of growth is what will make you happy. Not how your boss treats you, not how much money you're making, but you got to feel like you're growing. and you got to feel like you're part of something that you're, you're doing more today than you were yesterday. Um, and I think on the reciprocal side, I think also, you know, you got to make sure you earn your keep. Whatever job you have or whatever relationship you're in, I always think like, you know, staying married for 35 years. I'm not sure what that says about my wife, but I've been married for 35 years. And I think that, you know, my most important thing when people say, you know, what do you think the key is? I think you got to earn your keep. Like, I, I don't go home every day assuming that my wife's going to be there. I got to earn my keep, make sure that she wants to be there. And if it means uh, unloading the dishwasher or booking some travel trip or whatever it is. You know, I think when you're in a relationship, you got to earn your keep. You cannot, and that's where the gratitude comes in. You can't take relationships for granted. You can't take the good things that are happening in your life for granted. And you got to earn your keep. And that's, I think, a very key ingredient in um, really in, in, when you're working, even in your company with your employees, you know, you got to earn your keep. You got to make sure that your employees know you care and that you're with them. You got to make sure your wife knows that, you know, that today matters. Like you, you. Uh -huh. Sticking around for 35 years yeah. matters. So, you know, enthusiasm and curiosity is really a, a, a cornerstone to everything. Like, you know, you got to want your marriage to grow a little bit. You got to want your friendships to grow a little bit. You know what I mean? These are things that matter quite a bit. So when people ask me about entrepreneurism, I'm like, no, it's not something you're born with. It's something that you create. You know, you've got to get your back against the wall and you've got to turn the volume up on your curiosity and enthusiasm. And part of that is not just working a zillion hours, but part of it is having faith, having some belief and having some trust that, you know, that just things that weigh out are not in your control, that, you know, there's some higher powers that are helping you along. And yeah. I believe that.
Yeah, absolutely. I'm going right, to rant so, there. Sorry about that, man. I went off a no, little bit on a tangent there. But, no, I love it. I love it. Matter of fact, you don't even realize this, but I also got asked to teach a mental toughness course to hard. Um, they don't even like that word. We're going to say that, but they were boys that are high school that are court were court appointed, and they want advice because you know they got it from me. They said. Do they really stand a chance? To quote some of the kids, everyone thinks they're the cause of it. They don't believe in them. There's so many naysayers. I mean, they're they're from bad, hard knocks, and they're living there 24 hours a day with ankle bracelets. They want to know, is there really a chance for that? Well, I think there's two things. I mean, I, I'm in the middle of writing my fourth book, and I'm into some of these bad, really bad neighbors and communities that I really see that it's not easy. Yeah. This is incredibly challenging for a lot of kids in, in urban city neighborhoods that are surrounded by bad influences and bad people. But I think the most important thing for any person, wherever they are, is they got to realize that they're accountable for their actions and there's nobody coming around to help them. And you know, when you realize that, like everybody has a moment in time and realize that they're responsible for their life. They're responsible for where they're at and they're responsible for everything that's going to happen going forward. Then good things can happen, whether you're incarcerated, ankle bracelet, you're some rich kid that you know your parents are helping you with, with, with money every week. At some point, if you want to be happy, you need to take the level of accountability and realize and stop looking for other people to come in and save the day. Now, I think that there's some tremendous disadvantages of some kids that are growing up in urban na- neighborhoods that there's so much poverty and so much uh, mm-hmm. distress and everything else. Yes. Is it a big, is it a bigger climb? Yes. Is it doable to get out of that climb? Yes. But it, it's going to take a very strong personality and it's going to take some help, you know, parenting. I can't emphasize how important parenting is, you know, moms in the world, they're the most important people on the planet because they're always a sure bet that your, your kid's going to listen. If you're going to listen to anybody, you're always going to listen to your mom. So moms have an incredible impact. Uh, and and I always say, you know, and it's possibly true that, you know, if you want to see a happy kid, you know, look at the mom. If the mom's happy and she's optimistic and she's opportunistic, it's a good chance. I don't think my mother was the happiest person, hence is why I'm probably not the happiest person, but she was incredibly opportunistic, hustle, mm-hmm. a lot of drive, and, and I picked that from her. So, you know, as a mom, I tell people out there, if you're going to be a mom, realize that you your happiness will have an incredible impact on your kids. When I look at a lot of those kids, they come from extremely, besides broken homes, but very unhappy moms. Um, and it's it's really important, you know, moms realize no matter what they're going to go through, that they got to make sure that they find some happiness as they're raising their kids or they're going to raise a miserable kid. That's not, that's not, uh, that's not. That's, you know, not bulletproof, not That's ready. Fine. I've never heard it said that way, but, you know, it's so true. All right. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of those guys. I don't even know where I even come up with these ideas and thoughts. So, let's, I mean, I'm not sure not where I can, you know, I where know. Where it is. Well, I do believe, like, your kids know. They know if you're faking it. They know if you're happy. I mean, I know my son knows, like, if I had a bad day and I'm like, hey, but mom, come on. What's really wrong? They pick up everything. So, whatever yeah. you can do. I do, I do want to say one thing. I, I think one of the main things that, you know, when I see Black Lives Matters and stuff like that, you know, what I tell a lot of my friends, you know, a lot of privilege, I mean, I'm, a, I'm in a privileged zone now, even having grown up in a really bad, you know, very poverty stricken situation. But we need to quickly get into these cities and into these urban areas. And we need to put more resources in better schools, more mental health. I mean, these people are at a major disadvantage, but I would take any of those kids with those ankle bracelets and let them live in my house and they'd be a VP of some company one day. I I know that. That's a fact. So it's very troublesome when you see so many young, brilliant potential kids that that are just hopeless and and they have no, they have really no future and they don't have the confidence because you know uh, that it's not them, it's the circumstances that they're in. So having driven around quite a bit in these neighborhoods as part of my next book, you know, I see so much of this hopelessness and it's very bothersome. And I think we need to really start thinking about the level of crime that's going on in our cities and the lack of, 
you know, the police being able to do something about it. And the way we can help solve that is by putting more mental health counselors in. We yeah. have to get more, you know, mental health available to people who have poverty. And we've got to increase the quality and the quality of these schools that are in these neighborhoods. All the good teachers and all the good money is going right. towards the rich neighborhoods and the private schools. And it's right. not right. And that's a very big, very big problem to me um, as I'm getting my arms wrapped around it. And we'll have to do another pod to follow up. My next book will come out hopefully by the summer. And uh, we get really into this subject matter. You hit a real nerve here, but just, just say. No, it's it funny real. because they're going to think that you knew what I do. Never met me. I didn't prop them because they, yeah. this is a big thing for me. And the mental health, and I'm not a therapist, but I go in and teach all different types of um, mental health strategies for these kids. And everyone's saying, why do you choose that? <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you something. I just finished a six-week program at one of these schools for all boys. It was the most challenging thing, Brandon, but it was the most rewarding. They taught me so much, and they taught me how to become a better teacher. I mean, seriously, brightest kids, amazing. Yeah. But it was challenging. They gave me a run for my money, but it was. And so when I was interviewed afterwards, they're like, would you do it again? I'm like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Somebody's got to. Yeah. You know? All right. So let's talk about what you're doing right now, which I love that that's a passion. We will definitely have to talk about that more because it's a very much dear to me. Why did you start these new business? You were telling me before we zotted out that everyone was like, what the heck are you doing? Just enjoy life. Well, you know, first of all, I didn't have a really good game plan about what I wanted to do going forward. I'm not a big golfer, not a big hiker, not a big sit around the pool guy. So that's a problem. So, and I, I really like what I do. You know, I think I'm really good at what I do. I think I'm one of the best at what I do. And I didn't work this hard my whole life so that one day I wouldn't have to do it. Um, and then I, I feel like with the stuff that I'm doing, I can do more good. Um, you know, I have the ability now to help more charities, have more influence using the celebrities, athletes, and then the money that I earn. I mean, those are some of the reasons. I, you know, I, I don't, I, I also want to send a message to people that are a little bit older that, you know, that that paint's not dry. You know, take your hand off the controls and it's delete, baby. Like, you, you finish when you say you're finished. It's unbelievable how discriminatory people are in this country when they see older people. Like, and listen, there's nobody, I don't care what age they are, they're not going to have my work ethic. They're not going to have my resilience and, and, and hustle. I don't care who you are, what you are, but you know, like I, I get a lot of mentorship from younger kids. You know, they're a little different. Their approach is a little different, but they get shit done incredibly quick. Um, yeah. They really are amazing uh, on, you know, working certain apps and working certain systems. And, you know, we can, we can reverse mentor. So I, I love having some younger people around me. I love their approach because it's so much different than mine. And we try to find a happy medium. I highly recommend that with older people is like, don't, don't age out. Like, just get some younger people around you, man. And, you know, and 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 be open to it. Like, realize that you know they're just because they don't know what a rotary phone is doesn't make them a bad person. I tell them all the time. It's like the you know the number one app on your phone, the number one app on your iPhone. You know what that does not get used. You know what that is? It's the phone. Oh. It's the phone. <laughs> Nobody calls anybody anymore. But I'm still a dialer. You know, so like I, I think reverse mentorship is huge. I think it's amazing. Um, I think that young ones have a lot to bring to the table. Um, they need some more experience. They're in a little more of a rush or their expectation levels are a lot, uh, a little bit unrealistic as opposed to we knew we had to go grind for 15, 20 years before anything could happen. We knew that. We saw that with our parents. Now, a lot of the younger generation think it's going to happen a lot quicker, but it's not going to. And I think they'll learn from that. But but they're still really smart. They have the ability to have, get more information in a day than we would take in, in months in a year. So, you know, it, it all, it all even out. I mean, so I'm, I'm excited to still work, especially in a, in a, in a, in a company that I'm developed that's much different than my expertise. I'm now, you know, my two websites, Collectible Exchange and Starstock are on web, they're web, they're technology. Uh, they're not right in my sweet spot. I'm used to having a store, somebody walking in, more direct yeah. consumer. So these, these are a different new thing for me. And, and I've been enjoying the challenge and learning how to do that. And then using some of my expertise to incorporate in. So I tell people like dreaming is not just for young people. 
You know, you could dream all the way to the day they decide they're not going to let you hang out on the planet. So, you know, keep your dreaming up high, uh, leads you, lead you to a lot of good things. And, and uh, for me, I've always been a good daydreamer. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that slip down. <laughs> I'm writing down so many things you're saying. No, my friend, like, it's so much I, 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 my friends are a lot of, we have a lot of uh, public speakers in our group and they always say, I'm not ready to get off the stage. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. You know? I'm, I'm good. You know, like I've, I've gone and done speeches where, you know, I'm supposed to go on for 45 minutes and the, the, the event planner would say, look, you got 29 minutes. I'm like, whatever you need. I, I'm a, I'm, I, I could talk for, for an hour. I could talk for 15 minutes. And yeah. I, I think it's a lot easier to give a one hour speech. But, you know, it takes a huge amount of effort to give a five minute speech. Huge. I mean, it takes me yeah. 10 times more preparation time to give a five minute talk to speak for an hour. So, like, I, I, I'm up for either challenge. I have no problem. Now I go to conferences and I'm, I'm grateful they pay me. And, and again, I'm making money for the charities. But, you know, the time that they allot me is less than ever before because the attention span is less and, and you got to move with that. So I've learned to condense my messages and focus in on the points that, you know, that, 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 that the group wants me to focus on. Did you do a TEDx? Yeah, I did a TEDx. I went to Syracuse. Look up Brandon Steiner on YouTube. Uh, TEDx, Brandon Steiner, Syracuse. I, I love that TED Talk. I'd probably do a better job. I did that like 12 years ago. But it's it talks oh. about that I sold over 50, I sold over 50 million dollars of dirt and how how I kind of, the whole moral of the story is your first idea is not your best idea. And then you can always take a really, really good idea and take your good idea and make it great and then make that great idea even better. Um, I think some of the great ones, when you look over the time of history, the great ones are not all over the place with a million great ideas. They've managed to zone in on one thing and just keep honing in on it. I always say the people at Apple are not trying to work on the Walkman. They're not trying to come up with other things. They're, they're just continually improving the iPhone. You know, it's not like they're coming out with a million things. You know, maybe they come up with the earbuds, but, you know, or a different kind of connector. And, and you know, the, it's really important to try to be really good at one thing. And then a lot of doors will open up for you to do a lot of other things. That's okay, a TED so, talk. That's my TED talk. It's a good one. If you go yeah, online, I'm, doing, read, I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm doing one in a few weeks, April 6th. And I'm starting, you know, I'm not getting nervous, but I had to take my whole freaking hour keynote and make it 10 minutes. And I'm like, 14, oh, actually. 14, is it a big eight. enough idea? Is it a big enough idea? You know, I'm starting like, ah. yeah, you got 14 minutes. No, I only got eight to 10 for this one. It's more than enough time. <laughs> you're right you're right okay so let's get to the real thing that i want to ask you because it's one of my favorite things in the entire world did you really come up with the everything bagel i need yeah. to know yes you come on i was a kid and i was delivering bagels to save you the story because I've, I've talked about that story forever but you know, I was delivering oh, yeah. bagels in order to get the people to get the big to get the uh, paper delivered back when I was 12 years old, which is 52 years ago. Um, I convinced a lot of the people in the neighborhood that I'd bring them milk and bagels. Around the corner from my house was one of the original bagel factories in Brooklyn. Remember, this is 1972, and yeah. there weren't there weren't bagels anywhere. There was this big bagel factory, and then they they deliver the bagels to all the supermarkets and the grocery stores. Now, like you get a bagel everywhere, but Back then, that's not the case. So as I was picking up so many bagels and milk for these people I was delivering the paper to, which my paper rack got huge, and I was delivering bagels all over the place, the guy said, hey, do you want to come in and, and uh, bake bagels in the morning with me? We started at 4 in the morning. You work till 7.30, deliver your newspapers, and go to school. I said, great. Well, I did that, and after that's about great. three months, <laughs> I just want you to understand the level of hustle. But after about three, four months, I was falling asleep in school. So I went in. I said, look, you know, I, I don't think I could do both. I was like 12 years old. And he goes, no, no, don't quit. Don't quit. I'm going to give you a raise. My night baker quit. And the night baker just baked a few dozen here and there for the people that were walking in. In the morning, we were baking thousands of bagels. I mean, so I can go right now into a bagel shop and bake bagels, make bagels, the whole thing. I mean, I've been trained well. But. So at night I was a little, you know, I, I took that. That was great. I didn't have to wake up early anymore. And then I, and then one night I was just trying to screw around I, over a few nights. 
with all different seasonings and everything else. And then I had tried, you know, poppy and salt and this and that and everything else, onions, scrape the onions down and mixing that up. And then I had all these seeds on the bottom as I was trying this and I threw everything onto the bagel. And that's how we got the everything bagel. Yeah. Hero. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't make any money off of that, but it's still, you know, it's still pretty cool. I was happy, great, grateful to come up with that idea. But I was always thinking like, you know, I remember going to my mother uh, about a year after that. I said, mom, I got this idea. I'm going to get a van. I'm going to cut out the side of the van, put a huge bagel on the top. And I go up and down the streets of Brooklyn and people can come up. I have the bagels, I have the locks and different versions of cream cheese. She's like, that's a good idea. But you're, you know, you're 14 years old. You don't drive. I was like, yeah, I guess that's a good point. But, you know, I was always thinking about, you know, creative ways to hustle and, and grind. And um, so, you know, I don't wake up in the morning thinking about how I'm going to make money. I'm, I'm waking up in the morning thinking I'm going to execute it. But, you know, I've been doing it for so long. I mean, I've been thinking about how to make money since I'm 10 years old. So, you know, a, a big part of who you are is where who raised you and where you grew up. And a lot of the stuff that happens as a kid, like I tell younger ones all the time, like don't wait to get started, you know, build your career. And, and build your work ethic and everything now. A lot of kids, oh, when I graduate college, then I'll worry about it. Like, no, 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 no. This book here is my first book, The Business Playbook. This is a book that gives every kid that's in high school, college, all the tools you need to get your brand, to get yourself started. There's nothing in this book that you can't put in play. It's really simple. There's a lot of pictures in there. So I'm not a big reader. There's a lot of pictures. It's a very simple book. And, and, when I started my new business four years ago, I went back and read this book and followed all the simple tools that I did when I started my first business that I did really well with. And I put the same thing in play here. I love it. So wait, are you, um, how many hours are you working now? Have you cut back? Because I know with the two businesses, you said you started four years ago. I mean, that's a lot of work, man. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't. I don't have a shot clock in my office here. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there, there, there are weeks. I mean, I, I, I would be embarrassed to tell you because um, I, I don't want to think about that. I just, I'm thinking about doing as much as I can, okay. you know, it's, you know, but you know, I, I, I'm a worker, you know, I like working and, you know, there's nothing that stops me from getting up four or five in the morning and working all day, all night. And then, you know, I've been trying to cut back a little bit on some days and, I think my better cutback is not necessarily how many hours, but if I'm traveling more with my wife, we're doing more trips and oh, good. To get away and going on more vacations. Like, you know, I'm, I'm at work. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not thinking, Oh, wow. It's time for lunch. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm going to maybe, I'll figure no, out you're into it. You're into but, it. You know, I've been trying now to really uh, lighten up on my weekends and really trying not to work too much on the weekends. If I can, that's different than what I used to do. You know, you got to kind of, you know, I'm getting a little older, but I also get a lot more done in less time. So how many hours do you work? I mean, I don't know if you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you're going after it and you're looking at the, your clock, find something else. That's yeah. Probably, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Right. yeah. So are you still involved? Um, I was reading with the family services in Westchester. Um, not as much as I was. I had the two homes for about 15 years. I've kind of changed. I've kind of pivoted now. I'm working on some different things. I'm working a lot with police. It's one of oh. my big initiatives, uh, trying to trying to help and try to get the police and the communities a little more in sync. Um, and I'm really just getting behind a lot of my athletes' charities. And it's just easier for me to get behind what they're doing. They have a bigger influence. Um, always love helping kids. And so I jump into a lot of little charities. I don't want to have this foundation. And I, I don't think the whole giving and my charity efforts are about me. So I'd rather take a much more lower key approach mm -hmm. and, and try to just do things as I see fit. Um, and then I think a lot more gets done when I get behind what the athletes are doing because they just have such a big platform, a big voice. Absolutely. Brandon, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And I'm so glad we figured it out. I would have been so sad. Well, thank but you. Before, before we go, is there something, anything we didn't get in that you want to say to let's keep it real people? You know, I, I post a lot of content. I'm one of these guys, not a typical 65 year old, but I post a lot of content on LinkedIn and Facebook, Instagram. Come visit me, message me. I love hearing if you got a problem or you're at stock, you got a juggernaut, something in the way from where you are versus where you want to go. Love hearing it. I, I answer everything. So I try to help as many people as I can. So don't be afraid to come to me with 
some outrageous problem or something and um, keep grinding. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grinding. I love my two new companies. If you have collectibles out there, call me, let me know what you got. I'll see if I can help you with your cards and collectibles. And, you know, the world is, you know, let's, let's just keep our fingers crossed that, uh, you know, we can find a way here with some of the craziness that's going on in the world. You know, and now figures, when I was looking at your website, I saw that Gary V was on there. And I'm like, now it makes sense. Similar person out. I love Gary. I mean, I have a great relationship with Gary. What's funny is like, we, you know, Gary always wanted to be me when he grew up, which is outrageous. Oh. Gary's such a legend in his own right, but he was a big collector. And, uh, you know, I love Gary's mindset and I'm very grateful to have a relationship with him. I've learned from him. I follow him as he sometimes, I think he comments on mine. So he follows me a little bit. Um, I think he's got a lot to give and I think he's done a lot and I don't think he's done yet. Uh, nor am I. So, He's a guy that I go to and share some different ideas and big picture ideas and, and always get crisp, good feedback. He's a great thing that people don't realize about Gary. He's a great listener, tremendous nice. listener, really, 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 really amazing listener. And I think it's one thing I learned from him is like, shut up, Brandon, listen and really listen and not hear, listen. And he's, he's, you know, people always say it's so important to listen, but he is a master listener. And that's yeah. how he's so knowledgeable and, and he's able to do some of the things he does. It's a skill, man. And you have to work on it. I work on it yeah. every day, especially when you love to talk. You have to work on that skill. All right. Tell them again how they can find you because you mentioned social media, but yeah. I just want to know what it's under. Well, all my speaking stuff's on brandonsteiner.com. If you want to get any of my books free, by the way, just pay for the shipping. Go to collectibleexchange.com. Okay. And, you know, go, if you go on LinkedIn, just have to follow me because I'm uh over the limit or just like me on Facebook or Instagram. It's season. All right, my let's keep it real people. We really appreciate you. And Brendan and I would really like it if you rated and shared it. There's so many people that could benefit from this. And you know what I'm going to say until next time. Thanks, Brendan and toodles. <laughs>